You're listening to Let's Talk AI. Welcome to Let's Talk AI. I'm Harold Godwin, Managing Director for Waterloo AI. I'll be your host today. Our guest is Maura Grossman, and Maura is a research professor in the School of Computer Science here at the University of Waterloo. She is also an adjunct professor at the Osgood Hall School of Law. So welcome, Maura. Hi, Harold. It's great to be here with you. Awesome, Maura. We're so excited to have you here today. And, you know, you've got such a storied background from industry and law and, and, and justice system. Let's uh, just kind of back the bus up a bit and tell us, how did this all start? get started, computer science, AI, and, and, where we, and how we got here today? Sure. I actually started as a clinical psychologist and hospital administrator, and I did that for about a decade, and I was in the United States, and managed care came into the picture, which completely changed the healthcare system in the U.S., and so I decided I did not want to work in the hospital scheme as it was the direction it was developing. And so I decided to go back to law school. So I went back to law school, became a lawyer, and I started in a New York firm where I was a litigator. And I did that for six or seven years, and I found myself drowning in digital evidence. The cases I was working on, for example, World Trade Center, the Bernie Madoff scandal, there were so many emails and, and other kinds of electronically stored information. And the question becomes, you have 20 million emails, how do you find the 100 that make a difference in a case? And I started to get interested in whether there were any technologies or computer programs that could help with this problem. And I started to attend computer science conferences, and I ran into this guy, Professor Gordon Cormack, who was from Waterloo, who was a spam guru. And the sort of light bulb went off in my head, spam and ham, relevant evidence, not relevant evidence. So I went up to him and I asked him, I do this litigation stuff and I want to find evidence and separate the wheat from the chaff. Can you, can you help me with your spam filters? And we ended up working together and converting his, what was a spam filter into a litigation tool that could separate relevant evidence from not relevant evidence. And so I started in the area of information retrieval and ended up in Waterloo the university. And here I am trying to figure out, well, what is a clinical psychologist and a lawyer going to do in a school of computer science? And I noticed while there were a couple of courses on social impact uh, of computing, there, there really wasn't a lot on sort of the ethics and the policy and the legality of of what students were doing. And, you know, as AI started to come into the picture, I started to think maybe it would be helpful to teach a course on responsible AI, how to think about what it is you're building and the implications uh, of that. Well, this is a hugely hot topic now with the, you know, I always say the tsunami of AI is coming in every direction. And you see so many great tools, but then people say, is that ethical? What does that even mean now with respect to AI? What's that thought? How do we use it? We, we have those thoughts for human behavior, but what about AI? Well, in, in terms of the AI, it's AI is a tool. It's software. It's neither bad nor good inherently. It is how we use it. And it's. I think the key issue for me is getting computer scientists, data scientists to think about who benefits and who gets hurt from what I'm building or what are the unintended consequences uh, of this particular tool? Who, you know, is there bias? Is there, are, are there people for whom they are, are, are not going to experience advantages? So I started thinking about how are we using AI and 
what are the implications of what we're building? Who who gets benefited and and who gets harmed? Uh, and those kind of questions. And instead of just you know build fast, break things. Maybe maybe you ought to be thinking a little bit more about what's going to get broken and maybe not breaking it. Well, you mentioned the student aspect of this, but if we step once removed, I mean, companies are developing AI. Is there evolving guidelines or standards for what is for you know for you know people who are trying to make money from and use it this way? How do they know what's ethical or not ethical? There are tons of guidelines that are available, and and they tend to emphasize the same five or six six things like trustworthiness, accountability, fairness, all you know those kinds of characteristics or values that are that are important to all of us, and we're trying to get companies to think carefully about the same sorts of issues that I mentioned with respect to my students is, you know, yes, there's, these can be commercialized and they can be of, of great use and great benefit, but there are also people who potentially could get harmed by them. And, and that's what they need to be thinking about. So if we go back to where the first concept you mentioned was trust, I mean, that, that, that is a, with all the fake news and you, what is real? What, what, what actually is real? Are, are you and our, are, is this a real conversation or is it two robots talking right now, simulating our voice? You know, how do we know what, it, I mean, trust is based on reality, but what's, again, the filter for that? I think for me, as particularly as a lawyer, and one of the areas that I've been writing on a lot is the impact of these deep fakes in the justice system. So here's the issue. Most of the justice system to this point, whether it is the judge or the jury, has been able to look at evidence and use their senses and determine who's telling the truth, what's real, what's not real, and so forth. And we're moving into an era where that has become more and more challenging, uh, if not almost impossible without you know, bringing in very expensive experts. And even then, it's not always discernible. But what happens when either your judge or your jury becomes so cynical that because they can't figure out, you know, what is real and what is not, so they stop uh, determining cases based on the evidence and rather whether they like the lawyers or the defendant's shirt uh, or not. And then you've got the exact opposite problem that's called the liar's dividend, which is where everything becomes subject to doubt, even if it's real. So you can always say, well, that's not me. That's a deep fake. You know, in, in the pharmaceutical vice, which things for a minute here to get a drug to market, it's got to go to the double blind tests and, you know, all these things. And they weren't there in the beginning. I mean, through effort and pain, we figured out a system Do you think there's going to be some kind of a dual or triple standard to verify things uh, evolve in the future? Or or how are we ever going to get to that point, like you said, beyond the the liars and the, you know, things like this? How are we going to solve this? So there's been a lot of discussion about watermarking or um, somehow inputting information into digital things like images or, or videos or audios that will sort of signify their provenance, whether they're real or, or they're, they're deep fakes. So there's been talk about this watermarking process where companies like OpenAI would put a watermark in, in a, something created by Dolly so that you would know from the beginning, it maybe wouldn't be visible to the eye, but you could go into the actual media and and see that it's, you know, been marked that it was generated by an AI. Or we could have things on our phones that when we take a picture, mark it as genuine. And I think that technology will improve. There already is some of it. Whether we can get everybody to use it, you know, is another story. You know, I was listening to a clip of something the other day, and it was it started to sound too good to be 
true. And then you heard the voice mispronounce the word Harvard. And it was like, oh, there it is. That is is a, a voice automation. And it's like, wow, if I hadn't have known that, and if I hadn't tripped up there, how would how would we know? How would we know as, you know, I want to say consumers, but even for businesses and government, like how will we know though on voice things? I think for the foreseeable future, we may need experts who can do forensic kinds of examinations of this of this media. But I, I think as time goes on, there will be technical ways of determining the provenance of, of information. There will be standards that come out that uh, will allow a company, for example, to put this stamp into something at the beginning to indicate this is real or this is not real. Okay. So we touched on trust and ethics a bit. Let's go back to the responsible you know, pillar here. There's a lot of perspective in that, you know, and, and can you talk further on that? Sure. So I, I talk a lot to my students in class about the difficulty we have in building either something that's responsible or that's fair in particular. If you and I don't have a consensus definition of what that means. So, for example, you think fairness means everybody should be treated equal, and perhaps I think fairness uh, means something more akin to equity, that we should give people not exactly the same thing, but what they need based on what their circumstances and, and history was. Well, it is impossible to build an algorithm that meets both of those definitions. So we have to have a definition of what it means to be responsible or to be fair. And is that something that is a combination of government, industry, academia? Like, how is that definition you think is going to come together? I think we have to have all the stakeholders at the table. So people who are impacted uh, by algorithms and who have less power probably will feel very different about those definitions uh, than, say, a company, that a big tech company. So I I think you've got to get all of these different stakeholders at the table. and, And I think the decisions have to be explicit. So take a car, an autonomous vehicle. If you want it to protect the passenger, to the exclusion of the pedestrian um, because you're buying the car, but I'm a pedestrian and I don't drive and I want the car to protect uh, the pedestrians at the expense of of the driver. We we need to have an agreement about that. We we need to make that explicit so that when you're buying the car, you know uh, who it's designed to protect. Has that dialogue happened before AI? No, and we don't have enough of that dialogue, even with AI. We're not we're not discussing those trade offs as much as uh, I would like, and as I think would be uh, optimal. I think right now, even if you see the development of the um, generative AI tools, they're all rushing to market because they want to get maximum market share. But we're not having enough of these these kinds of discussions. So data is the fuel that drives AI. And, and, you know, you talked about your 20 million emails and how do I get to the, you know, the 100 that make the difference. How do these things, we, if stepping out of the AI filter and go to the data filter, do the same things apply there or are there different special concerns respect to data itself? So, for instance, is there is there trust for data? Is there ethics? Is there responsible data? You know, all these kind of same words applying to data or are they oh, slightly I, I, different? Yeah, absolutely, because uh, your AI is trained on your data. And if your data hasn't been properly cleansed, if your data is not representative of the group you're going to use your AI to make predictions on, uh, you're going to have a lot of problems. We've seen that with facial recognition, for example, that is primarily trained on pictures of light-skinned males. And then when it's used on dark-skinned females, it's 35% less effective 
And uh, that leads to all kinds of mischief. So yes, the provenance of the data is critically important. We had a, a discussion the other day and people were talking about trust and one of the professors mentioned a data market so that they could be bought and sold, not like a stock market, but an ability for to get more quality data. But as soon as you start to pay people for data or there's an economic model, does that again potentially tamper or taint the, the efficacy of the data? Uh, absolutely can. We've seen with even online workers now that the GPT and other tools like that are available, sometimes they're they're now using those tools instead of answering the questions that they're they're supposed to be answering and that and that they're being paid to answer and that degrades the quality of the data. It's like making a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. Uh, you know, the more the AI is involved in generating the the data, the lower the quality. And so, yeah, this is this is a problem. So let's swing back to the whole student perspective. Exciting new tools for them, this new era of AIs ramping up. How do they still have their standards of, I need to actually write this as opposed to, I need to throw a few keywords at chat GPT and let it write for me. How are they going to, how do we help them still keep that, you know, that level of ethical standards to their work and efforts? It's really challenging because on the one hand, you want them to be familiar and comfortable with the tools because they're going to need to be able to use them out in the world once once they start working uh, at their co-ops and so forth. On the other hand, you don't want them to outsource all of their thinking. And one of the things that, that I say in the ethics classes that I teach is it's fine if you want to use this to fix up your grammar, make your sentences, you know, cleaner or something like that. But don't outsource your thinking uh, to the to AI because then you're not the person who's learning how to be ethical. I need you to struggle and grapple with these issues. And, and I'm not t here teaching an AI. So it's a, it's a hard sell, but it, it scares me that the students won't learn the critical thinking and particularly writing because computer scientists don't have to do a lot of writing other than code that that they won't develop these skills if if they find it too easy and too convenient to just have have a tool do it for them we hired recent round of hiring an intern for our team and one of the requirements i asked is that they include a bold you know engaging cover letter and I could clearly see those who cut and pasted the job description, dumped it into ChatGPT, put their name, and got a cover letter written by ChatGPT. It just was like, you just regurgitated my words here. Like, you know, and whereas I could see those which were authentically written, but it, but again, it, it's it, the student's like, well, I did my cover letter. Well, actually, you didn't, you know. So, and that's, that's, uh, that's like you say, the ability to be able to write and communicate is, is vital. So, I'm going to swing now to the, the big issue here is policy. You know, I mean, there's, I think, maybe inappropriately, the, uh, some of the Canadian government has been, uh, why are we so slow? Why isn't there more, you know, because Europe's been leading with their data data standards and and the US has come with an AI acts and things how do we like back to this idea about getting the right stakeholders at the table how do we do this who are the stakeholders and how do we get this policy you know good for all if you want to call it that well one of the things you mentioned at the beginning I teach at Osgood Hall well we need our lawmakers and our regulators to know something about technology because they don't, lawyers don't speak the same language as computer scientists. So you need to have both at the table. You need technologists and, and you need people who know something about law and policy, but they, they need to have some common ground of, of language to be able to communicate with each other. And if uh, you know, you you get the people who are writing the laws, but they don't have an understanding of how technology works. You get 
laws and regulations that are very blunt instruments that basically get in the way and impede innovation. Um, so you need both at the table, but but they also need to have some cross-disciplinary training. And we actually really need much more of that than we have today. You know, it's not just good enough to be a computer scientist. It's computer science and and uh, and I encourage my students to definitely to consider health or to consider finance or to consider law or some other area. But we also need people who don't have power who are impacted by algorithms. So that the, your racialized communities, your indigenous persons, you know, they need to be there too because often these tools are are used on them or against them and and they need to be part of the conversation there's going to be a in my vision there's going to be a lot of shall we say changing workforce as we go forward you know everyone talks about job cuts but there's job gains and, and different things so if you could just put your thoughts around even share with us what do you think what do you see the future law you know jobs in law or careers related to ethics and you know things like that I worry a little that this may be different than some of the prior industrial revolutions where inevitably there were more new jobs created than the old jobs that were replaced. I think it is possible that in this case, there may actually be some real displacement. You know, it's not like you can take all, if, if you have autonomous vehicles now that you can take every truck driver and, and make them into a prompt engineer, they just don't necessarily have the training for that. So I worry a little bit about that. I do think there'll be new jobs that will be created. I'm just wondering whether the, those are jobs will be able to retrain the people who are losing their positions to do. I think there's going to be some adjustment. I also think that school is not going to be one and done. I think there have to be micro credentialing so that you'll have to train for a short period of time in something, go work. And then as the technology changes, you may have to come back to school to get more expertise in, in a new area, as opposed to, uh, you know, when you and I went to college, you got your degree and you went out and you worked and you, maybe you took a few continuing legal education courses here and there. But I think that's going to become much more common. Yeah, that's a great thought, really. I mean, it it's this lifelong learning concept, really, and, and getting more people to buy into it. And, you know, I see that even in our own staff here at the University of Waterloo in a great institution. But how does the staff get involved in AI and how are they starting to learn and grow? And, and you know, that's why we have Wattspeed that's now rolling out more and more courses. So that's a really great thought there about uh, shifting our, our perspective and mindset. Because, you know, when I go talk to high school students, they're like, oh, I'm going to graduate from high school and I don't have to go to school anymore. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. That just got you to the, you know, the, the, the starting gate, right? Yeah, the starting line of, the, of learning ahead. So, and this is going to be uh, probably the biggest challenge is get people to realize, no, it's a lifelong learning, not just a one and done, as you call it. Well, this is great. Any final thoughts then to wrap up on uh, on ethics and trust, AI, you know, and what do you see? Uh, what's your thoughts there? I think this, we're in a place now where students, companies, nobody can stick their head in the sand. This is here and this is going forward, whether we like it or not. There have been a lot of uh, uh, fads in the past that you could say, ah, I'm just going to ignore this and, and it'll go away. But this one isn't. But I don't think it's, I, I'm not in this existential risk camp. I'm much more concerned with with the sort of palpable concerns that we can see today, the bias, the the black box phenomena where we don't understand things, the deep fakes. Uh, I'm less worried about, you know, robots taking over the world and, and making us all into paper clips. But I think people shouldn't fear this technology. Uh, they should embrace it and they should learn about it. And I think tools like ChatGPT and, and various variants have made it now much more accessible to the average person to, to use AI. Well, that's great. Well, thanks for those closing words. And again, thank you very much, Maura, for joining us today. This has been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. 